and my lovely people. Welcome to a uh, la la ba da ba da ba da. <laughs> Shall we do that again? Hello lovely people, welcome to another episode of Book Chat, the weekly roundup of stuff I have read at some point in the past. I have kind of three books to talk about this week, kind of four. We'll, we'll go into that. <laughs> I'm going to alternate fiction and non-fiction, so I'm going to start with non-fiction. Um, Life Moves Pretty Fast, The Lessons We Learned From 80s Movies and Why We Don't Learn Them From Movies Anymore by Hadley Freeman. This is a collection of essays all on 80s movies, um, but also specifically like um, different topics to do with each thing. So my favourite part of this is the first essay, which is all about Dirty Dancing, um, which was the real highlight of the collection for me. It talks about the way in which um, the writer of Dirty Dancing was really concerned about um, Roe versus Wade being overturned and so she made um, the abortion scene in Dirty Dancing is critical to the plot you cannot cut that out and have the movie still make sense it is the point upon which Baby and Johnny getting closer hinges um, and it completely flies under the radar half the time like you don't even think you're not like oh this is really groundbreaking to have an abortion scene in an 80s movie and also show the dangers of having abortion not be legally accessible and blah 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 all of these things that first essay really looks at that um and has a really great interview with the writer with other people involved um that essay was a real highlight of the collection for me as often happens with stuff like this some of the other essays worked better for me than others did um, my favourite essays of hers are the ones in which she has more of an argument that she's making, but also her voice is less strong. If they, <laughs> what I mean is, sometimes some of the, these essays felt a little bit too much like a small memoir of being like, this is my favourite film and I love it because X, Y, and Z. Um, telling me things, telling me that I, it is the best film ever made, like, if we're talking about Ghostbusters, but not really like showing me why it's the best movie ever made. Um, whereas some of these essays, um, her voice sort of almost goes into the background because she's highlighting, she's done loads of really interesting interviews, which is really great. That's a real plus of this. But some of those better, better essays, her is less her voice and more like, here's the argument, here are like correlating, I've talked to these people, these people, here are those thoughts, these are like my overarching argument. I liked those ones a little bit more than some of the other ones which just felt a little bit like being told why she thinks it's a really great film. And I was just like, I like the film. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's very clear. Um, I did really enjoy this as a collection. I think if you're someone who's really into 80s movies, it's a great thing to read. Um, I did not grow up in the 80s, so um, I've done all of my 80s film watching from like a looking back perspective. And again, some of my other favourite points of this were the bits that actually tie into this subheading, which is like why we don't learn these things from movies anymore, which looks at like the increasing um, how much harder it is for certain types of movies to be made in today's film market, the way in which um, marketing to international audiences tends to affect the sorts of things that Hollywood will make. Um, those sorts of topics, also very interesting, but again, not all of the essays tapped into them as much as some of the other ones did. So like, on the whole, I had a really good time reading this essay collection. It was a lot of fun. Um, it's just some of them hit me more than others did, which, you know, is fair and reasonable. <laughs> second book I'm going to talk about is The Thread by Victoria Hislop. Um, I read The Island. I have such a vivid memory. When I was in secondary school, so I think I must have been about 13 or 14, maybe, I don't really know how old I was, <laughs> but um, in the UK um, you have to do work placements, so you spend a week working somewhere and you have to fill in loads of booklets and be like, what have I learned, blah blah blah. And I did mine at a library, obviously. <laughs> But the library was on strike, so I had to go to a different library for a day. Um, and I was like shelving books, and then I saw The Island, and I was like, this sounds cool. So I read it, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I've had this book sitting, this was um, one of the books when my mum did a massive book clear out, I pilfered loads of her books, and this was one of them, because I was like, you know what, I really loved The Island. Um, I'll just try it, I'll try another of hers. Um, I don't know if it's just because I'm older, my reading tastes have changed. I didn't love this one as much. I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. It was a perfectly enjoyable time. It's all about Thessaloniki, and um, it starts in, starts in 2007, but it's really flashing back. 
Um, and it's these grandparents telling their grandson about why this place is so important to them. So what it really is, is it's like a little condensed history of that place. Um, I did know some of this history already, partly because I did a modern Greek literature module when I was at university and we did like a real blipvert and I would like to make it very clear I do not know Greek history very well but we did a little blipvert and one of the texts we focused on was um, Yorgos, Yorgos Yanou's uh, Refugee Capital which is a non-fiction book which is essays on his time in Thessaloniki um, during the t same time period that this focuses on largely World War One, the political upheaval and then World War Two and that sort of thing so this does a really good job, I would say, on the history front. If you are looking for a, a fictional way to learn a bit more about the history of Thessaloniki, this did a really great job. Um, the where it fell down slightly for me was just on like the actual characterization and the plot side, <laughs> which is like, you know, discuss. Um, one thing that I think Victoria Hislop does well is she does use these stories to show you history of a certain period. So that whole um, giving you the hi giving you like a little blip of history was really good. That was what I enjoyed about this. The story on this was just a little bit more of like a sort of predictable, you could see where it was going type thing. Um, and that wouldn't have bothered me so much, I think, if I'd been slightly more invested in the characters. I think something, I just wasn't super invested in the characters. And occasionally, there were just felt like there were a few inconsistencies of writing, which is why I felt like that. So, like, um, one of the characters is brought to Thessaloniki as, like, a refugee fleeing from a crisis. Um, and initially, she, like, is this, this is so minor, but she, like, leaves the house and is like, oh, it's fine. It's really hard to get lost in these streets. And then, like, five minutes later, she's lost. <laughs> And it was just, there were a few moments like that where I was like, consistency, lads. <laughs> is it hard or is it easy? This was perfectly fun. I had a really nice time reading it. I read it very quickly. Um, I just probably won't be reading any more Victoria Hislop because it's not really my thing anymore. But that's fine. Your reading taste change. Back to non-fiction. I also read Overshare by Rose and Rosie. Uh, Rose and Rosie are YouTubers. I've been subscribed to them probably, I don't know how many years now, but quite a lot of time. Um, so, I... I don't read a lot of YouTuber books because generally they're not the sort of genres that I'm looking for. Um, this kind of felt a little bit to me like Carrie Hope Fletcher's All I Know Now, which I read when it came out and I thought it was fine, but it was aimed at a younger audience than, uh, than me. And this felt slightly similar. There were big portions of this book, which to be honest with you, I skim read and didn't really read properly just because I'm not really the target for them. So it's just the sorts of things that are like lists and um, there's stuff at the end which is about um, coming out as bisexual and blah, blah blah and all of these sorts of things, things which just aren't really relevant to where I'm at with my life and that's not a criticism of the book, that's just obviously like this is for a particular audience and I don't fall into those categories because I am more the age of them rather than the age of a lot of their readers would be. Um, my favourite bits in this were, and the reason why I got it out from the library, is because I was very interested to hear them talk about the mental health chapter because um, I thought they did that really well in a way that will also be quite helpful to any younger people who are struggling with that sort of thing, who are thinking what on earth is going on, that sort of thing. I thought that was really good. And then also the stuff a bit about their um, their relationships and them growing and like how do you, you go from like this point and now you're in this point and they're thinking of starting a family and blah, blah, blah. I just was interested in that side of it of like, you know, existing as a same-sex couple in the UK and being interested in um, having children or like getting married and blah, blah blah all that sort of thing. I just thought that was interesting. So I don't have a huge amount to say on this because I will, I did really skim most of it, but um, I can see why it works for the audience that it's designed for. I'm just not the audience that it's designed for. <laughs> I feel like my final book is also a small cop out because this is a book that I DNF'd, but I'm going to talk about it briefly just to explain why. Um, so I tried reading The Scarlet Lion by Elizabeth Chadwick. This is historical fiction, it's focusing on William Marshall, who was a knight during like the reign of like uh, Henry II and Richard I, King John, that sort of thing. When he died, he was held up as like a pinnacle of chivalry and that sort of thing. I, um, have, I know stuff about him already because I do like vaguely history things for one of my mags. Um, but I just thought, I saw it in a little second-hand shop, I got it for like a quid, and I was like, let's check it out. The reason I've DNF'd this is largely just because this is not what I am looking for. I was looking for a slightly more nuanced view on William Marshall because I think William Marshall is a figure who, sure, if you're coming from an English perspective, 
solidly great knight. What a guy stormed a castle when he was about 70. That's pretty impressive. Um, but equally, um, to the nature of being a knight involves a lot of uh, dodgy things. So, like, if you were Welsh, you wouldn't love William Marshall very much. And also, like, all of the crusading, not so great from a modern perspective. All of these things. I was hoping for a slightly more nuanced take on the man, which is not what this is, which is fine. Um, this is, and I was getting it, I got about 100 pages in, and I was feeling like we were being quite, like, isn't he a great guy? <laughs> Which is fine, but it's not what I was looking for. I was like, a nuanced man was what I was hoping for. And so then I went on Goodreads and I checked some reviews, and everyone was talking about how, like, he's the pinnacle of nobility and blah, blah, blah which is just not what I'm looking for. I didn't want to read, this is like 500, this is nearly 600 pages actually, and I was like, do I want to spend nearly 600 pages being slightly annoyed at how this man's being presented? Probably not. The other thing that sort of tipped me over the edge was also, there's a hefty amount of romance in this, which again, not critiquing romance as a genre, wasn't really what I was looking for. And more specifically, I really don't like the word loins <laughs> being used to the extent that it was used in the small amount of this book that I read. And again, not shitting on romance. I, you just, you know, sometimes you don't realise a word bothers you until it's used a couple of times in quick succession and you're like, oh boy, loins really squicks me out a bit. So, like, I just decided this just isn't one of the books for me. So I just, but I got far enough into it that I was like, I want to acknowledge it, but I don't want to, like, shit on it. It's just sometimes you recognise that a book is not what you're after. It doesn't mean it's bad. I'm just like, my time is short. I'm not going to continue it. So, yes. <laughs> Those are all the books I wanted to talk about this week. As per usual, have you read any of these? More specifically, I'd be really interested to know, have you ever DNF'd things, not because they're terrible, but because they're just not what you're after? And if so, what were those things and what were your reasonings? I would be really interested to hear that. I haven't actually DNF'd a lot of books. I used to be like, I have to finish this book, but I am now embracing the DNF a little bit more as I have so many books and I'm just like, time is limited, etc. So I'd be interested in that, but otherwise, I hope you're having the loveliest day and I will see you next time for something different. <laughs>